Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. I'm so, so happy to welcome back my very, very good friend all the way from Canada, actually Nova Scotia, isn't it? The Naked Pastor. Oh, New Brunswick. Is that different? I mean, Canada is such a big country. (laughs) (laughs) Spoken like a true Canadian, eh? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So you're from, but we'll just say you're from Canada. Does that work? Sure. Okay, right. So. Yeah. We've got the Naked Pastor back online. So thank you so much, David, for joining me. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. It's about time. We, it's been a while, man. Oh, man. I mean, we've talked before. Obviously, we keep in touch on social media, and we're both yeah. in our podcast group, and we you know, chat and things like that. But it's been way too long since we've actually sat down and done another podcast. So this is yeah. way overdue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, way overdue. And in fact... Maybe. There's a couple of things that we need to reflect upon. One of the things is last summer, you and I were part of the conference on religious trauma with our another good Canadian friend, Jana Selby, who I just had on a little bit ago. She's putting on these divorcing religion workshops, as well as she's got a court 2022 coming up next year. That was a fantastic experience. I mean, I was so honored with you and Tim Sledge to be on that panel. I don't know. What were your impressions of that discussion? That we had yeah it, was, yeah it was great i mean i loved all those perspectives um and uh people were very receptive to it you know it's always a little bit nervous when um ex-pastors get on I'm, i always worry about uh ex-pastors falling into the pastoral role and getting on their preacher voice and everything but no it, was, it felt very real authentic honest and uh transparent which i'm totally That's my vibe. So I really appreciated it. That's the point of the naked pastor, isn't it? That metaphor is exactly, there's so many layers of irony. I know we've talked about this before, (laughs) but the fact that you even, you even want the word pastor associated with your, your brand, but that is your brand though. It's that's, that's the reflection of who you actually are, who you're becoming. It's such a fascinating image, isn't it? Right. Well, yeah, image, naked pastor as an image. I don't know. <laughs> we um, said don't do a Google search. search on naked pastor. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did struggle. I left the ministry in 2010 um, and left the church. Uh, so I did struggle with whether I wanted to keep the brand name naked pastor, but it had got, gotten so big by then that um, I, I kept on, I ha- hung on to it for a little while. And then people started saying, you know, you're kind of are acting like a pastor but online, like the world is your parish kind of a thing. And, um, you know, even though I um, am not your Christian pastor, you know, uh, I, I'm only interested in your spiritual progress and you get to decide how to be spiritual. And I'm here to support you, whether that makes you a better believer or a better agnostic or a better atheist or a better minister or a better ex pastor, whatever. I'm just here to help you and facilitate you on your journey. Um, so it's, I don't have any agenda there except to support you. So I kept the name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a great name though, isn't it? Cause I think it's got layers of levels and meanings, which I'm sure you've explored yeah. many times, you yeah. know, and it's such an ironic thing. That's one of the things going back to the court 2021, where you and Tim Sledge and I were on that panel along with uh-huh. Dan, Dan Barker of freedom for religious foundation, who's himself an ex evangelical pastor. So we had a yeah. fantastic discussion But one of the things that came out, I remember saying this, that in our current role, okay, we've taken that religious piece out of it, as you say, but I see myself as I'm a teacher at a college, I get to teach adults, which I'm very, very fortunate, but they're all military veterans. So in Mm. fact, I just had a cohort starting today, and I've already got two of the learners who said in the introduction part, they've got PTSD from combat. A lot of them are Iraqi and Afghanistan veterans. I've even got a Falklands veteran in this cohort. He's that wow. old, which is amazing going back to what 80, early eighties, yeah. but that's my role as a teacher. I don't have the religious piece, but I very much serve in a pastoral role for those learners. 
And someone said to me the other day, isn't that ironic that you've taken that religious piece out, but yet in so many ways, you're still functioning. You're using those skills, I guess, that we learned in the pastorate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's such That's an amazing great. thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I feel like I've come into what I've been preparing to do my whole life and didn't realize it. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I love what I do and I do it all day, every day. And uh, it keeps me busy. And there's a lot of people that respond to it. And I'm helping people. And that's what matters to me. So yeah, it's, it's great fun. Yeah, it really is. And that, that's what I was saying to a friend of mine, I met the other day, and I was telling her that, you know, I've met people literally all over the world, I would have never met you, for example, I wouldn't have met Janice, I wouldn't have met, and you know, we got friends in the Netherlands, we got friends in Australia, Tasmania, all over the world that are on this journey. And somehow we've come together Thanks to the magic of social media and everything else, right. everyone's kicking off about Facebook right now. But if it wasn't for those platforms, I would have never met a person like you. So, you know, that in itself is an amazing thing, isn't it? Yeah. The, um, a couple of weeks ago, I just said, hey, let's uh, on Instagram, I posted, um, hey, everybody, let's get to know each other a little better. Where, you, where do you live? Mm -hmm. And it was like, I think 1600 responses and from all over the world. I mm -hmm. mean, little villages I've never heard of in, in you know, the, the middle of the continent of Africa and, you know, Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, China, not China, but, uh, well, maybe China, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Japan, you know, uh, South America, like all over the world. And, and you know, uh, in fact, I just corrected somebody this morning. They said, you know, all this talk about deconstruction and all this, all this ex-evangelical stuff and spiritual abuse, they sort of blamed it on American evangelicalism. And I'm like, no, I'm afraid not. Mm -hmm. America's might be number one in everything, but they're not number one in spiritual abuse and, and uh, ex-evangelical and deconstruction. It's all over the world. People are deconstructing. I mean, True. look at, uh, look at Brazil. Um, my number one uh, city in the world of followers is Sao Paulo, Brazil hmm. and Portuguese speaking. But uh, there's people down there that are translating my cartoons into Portuguese. Down there, you're either uh, Roman Catholic or Pentecostal str or strong evangelical mm -hmm. um, and nothing in between. So there's a lot of deconstructing people down there who are really, uh, you know, relating to my content. And it's just, you know, it's fascinating. It's, it's incredible. And I, I'm, I'm very thankful for the Internet. Right it's now. amazing. Yeah, it does a lot of harm and damage, we know, because as we say, Facebook, there's all these investigations and Instagram, it's harming young women. However, on the plus side, it's allowed a person like you to hook up with somebody in, who speaks Portuguese in Brazil. I mean, how yeah. does that happen? 20, right. 30, 40 years ago, this doesn't happen. No. Not on the scale that you're experiencing, for sure. No, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's been, an amazing thing. Yeah. Although I'm, I'm with you. I'm very concerned of the direction, the harmful direction um, the internet's going. Like I, I don't like the meta universe idea. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, the, with the whistleblowers and everything on Facebook and, and so on, we know now that the protection of women isn't a priority and, you know, things like that are very, very concerning for me. Um, and I'm wondering how this is going to proceed. Mm. If there's going to be any gatekeepers at all, I mean, that Francis Haugen was just blowing the whistle, like I say, a month or two ago as we're doing this recording now. And has yeah. anything come out of it? There's been there was a little bit of a flap, I suppose. But has anything changed at Facebook? And they own so many other social media companies that they're so big and so powerful. So so much money involved. Right. They don't seem to care. Yeah, it was like when she when she mentioned that they wanted money invested in the protection of women and they couldn't find the funds, but then they found the funds for hiring 10,000 new, I think it was 10,000 new employees for gaming on on their platform. But, you know, so gaming came before women and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's it's pretty you don't need to read between the lines. It's it's pretty clear. <laughs> it's true where uh, their priorities are. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, making money. Yeah. Well, and we know as well that on the other end of the spectrum, the political divisiveness that platforms like Facebook and Twitter and some of the others have been party to because of Russian trolls and all that other stuff. I mean, that's kind of off the subject, I know, but that's that's fostered into a huge thing in Trumpism and evangelicalism. So it is somehow all related, isn't it? The political yeah. slash evangelical 
activity and that's all fueled by social media. Yeah. Like it had the, yeah, the whole thing about misinformation and hatred and division keeps mm-hmm. people on the website and that m- makes them more money for ad spending and so on. Uh, yeah, gets more clicks. It's, it's, blatant, it's a blatant uh, business plan that, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I vex about it a lot mm. because um, everything I do is pretty much online. And um, I, I really need to ask myself how I'm going to move forward in this new, you know, landscape. Well, and I know, like I said, we're not, this isn't why we were talking about this, but one of my good friends, Chris Shelton, who does the Sensibly Speaking podcast, I mean, a large portion of his promotion of his podcast is on Facebook, Twitter and Facebook, probably bigger on Facebook. And I saw a post probably a month ago and he said, I'm deleting Facebook. I'm getting off this platform and I know it's going to hurt my podcast. I know it's going to hurt my promotion, but I disagree with what Zuckerberg and the executives of Facebook are doing. So I'm getting off this platform, even though I know it's going to hurt my brand and my promotion. So at least Chris took a stand and said, I'm out of here, you know, but that's going to, we're shooting ourselves in the foot in a way, aren't we? Because as you say, so much of our work, if not all of it is all social media based. Yep. Yeah. It's a, it's a very perplexing problem. It's it's like, um, like, like cars, you know, Uh, Mm -hmm. It, it feels like a necessary evil um, where we want to move towards electric, uh, you know, not consuming fossil fuels, et cetera. It's going to take some time. Um, some would like to see it happen by 2030 and others are fighting against that. Um, and so it's, it's almost like we're in that um, provisional state of uh, that. I feel I am anyway, sort of that provisional state where, I, I kind of see what what's going on. I, I know what I want, but I, I can't eject right now just yet. It would it would kill me. So you know yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a catch twenty two. It's a very much catch twenty two. But I'm, I am going to figure it out though. But um, it's 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 I'm I'm thankful for the whistleblowers and yeah, I'm yeah. glad I know what's going on now. I got to figure out you know how to yeah how what to your response is. Well, this, yeah. yeah. Well, this is the irony of this whole thing. What led to me contacting you for this podcast now was right. the social media, the network, because right. as you saw, so the way this came about was that for the listeners that haven't heard the story, one of the ladies in our closed podcast group put a post up about a week ago, a week and a half ago. And she said she's new to the group. She's kind of binge listening to the old episodes from like two or three years ago. And she came across one that you and I did. And it's called something like uh, deconstruction. You're not crazy. You're just growing or something like that, where we talked about our journeys and everything. And Mm -hmm. she commented that she where she's at in her journey, it hit her so hard. She was driving on her way to work and listening to our conversation from two, three years ago, started crying because it was so powerful. She had to pull over to the side of the road. She couldn't carry on driving to work. It hit her that hard. And I think, right. my God, I mean, the, the a conversation that you and I had three, maybe four years ago, is so yeah. timely to this woman right now. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. I remember that conversation for sure. Um, mm-hmm. It's a powerful thing when, uh, um, you know, deconstruction, as many of us know, is a very confusing time. And it's it's really fascinating that uh, one sentence can pop out to us or an idea, and it just sort of shines a light on everything and brings incredible clarity and relief. Uh, I've experienced that. And um, that's, I think that's what she experienced um, where, you know, she, the light was turned on. She saw where she was at. It was incredibly validating for her and she didn't feel so lost and she felt like she had a way forward. So Mm -hmm. I I think that's, I think that's powerful. It really is. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to think that a conversation, I still come back to that, you know, that a conversation you and I had three, four years ago can have such an impact And I think, again, going back to your point about transparency, we're being transparent. This is the journey that we're on. And I'm not really the same person that I was when I talked to you three, four years ago. And we're all in this process, aren't we? I'm learning. I'm growing. We were just saying before we started to record that, I mean, I've talked about this. We got divorced, me and my uh, wife, about a year ago. And I'm now on these dating apps 
now. And that's a whole new thing because I've, I've never dated someone where that religious component wasn't a factor. You know, as mm-hmm. a Christian, obviously it was, that was one of the first, if not the first questions. And now I'm dating women and I think, okay, if I see the word Christian in their profile, I'm not interested. So that's a complete, I've got to rethink all that. So that's a new whole journey for me. So it does change, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, that's why um, I, I, I claim deconstruction is a way of life. And I discourage people from planning their reconstruction. Hmm. For me, um, deconstruction is clearing the rubble, clearing the, the landscape to let, it, it's like clearing a, a field of stones and weeds and sticks and um, things like that so that something good can grow, can grow um, out of that. Uh, reconstructing for me is just building another edifice of, of beliefs that you'll need to deconstruct from later. I'm, mm. I'm an old concept kind of guy. Um, when we bought this house, I, I tore down every wall on the inside, put up supporting beams and everything. Cause I like open concept. Mm-hmm. Of course we have exterior walls, but uh, my point being that we, you know, we're deconstructing our conditioning. We're deconstructing beliefs that we've inherited and adopted and, uh, so for me, that never ends. Just the world is constantly applying pressure to us to conform and um, to believe what it's telling us to believe and to accept what it's telling us to accept and to adopt what it's telling us to adopt. And uh, we, it, it t- takes constant diligence to resist that and to fight against that. And so for me, deconstruction never ends. That's why Growing never ends. Deconstruction, deconstruction isn't backsliding. It's growing and it's personal development. It's spiritual growth, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so, you know, I'm different than I was four years ago, ago and I plan to be different four years from now than mm-hmm. I am now. Yeah, it's true. You got a better beard now than you had four years ago. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I shaved some of mine off <laughs> about an inch, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't have much of a beard back then, I don't think. But look at that. You've got, got a, a shadow, but COVID, I started this in COVID when COVID started. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's filling out. It looks really good, I have to say. Unfortunately, for the listeners, they can't see that, but they'll have to look you up on social media to see the luxurious <laughs> growth of beard you got. But it's so true, isn't it? You know, that's one thing I learned from you. I've used this countless times in podcasts and in conversations with people. And that is your metaphor. You you talk about what is deconstruction? How does it actually work? You say it's like the twin trails of a train track. On the one hand, you could, if talking about Christianity, for example, on the one hand, you could be deconstructing your views about theology and God and the Bible and all that. And the other hand is your, your relationship with the church. And right. some people go down that road. They might get burned by a pastor or someone in a church and they have a real problem and they start questioning, what are they doing? What, at one point or another, whichever one you're on, it's going to impact the other one, isn't it? If you start questioning your views about God, it will affect your relationship with other people at your church. If you start questioning your relationship with people at the church, it'll start impacting on your views about God and the Bible and theology. So I have used right. that so many times. So thank you for that. That's such a powerful metaphor. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you want to add to that now, now four years later? Well, my, my observation is I'm, I'm mostly interested in people. I, I help people in a couple of ways. One is uh, deconstructing theologically. I almost guarantee that you're going to, it's going to interfere with your relationship with the church in some way or another. It's inevitable. Now, people who deconstruct from the church, especially if it's related to abuse or, or something like that. I, I will help them in that area, but that does not necessarily mean they're going to deconstruct theologically. In fact, um, I know a lot of people who've left the church who are very conservative. Uh, they want the church restored to its original pristine condition mm. or, or whatever. So leaving, never the church, had. <laughs> yeah, leaving the church isn't necessarily, yeah, there's no such thing as a pristine origins uh, even if you read between the lines in acts or whatever you know there was a lot of problems and uh so yeah deconstructing theologically almost guaranteed will affect your relationship to the church changing your relationship to the church will not necessarily affect your theology right it's true well as you say i mean look at acts the early chapters of acts i mean you have instant divisions instant infighting 
the church is like five minutes old, according to the narrative anyway, <laughs> and they're already having problems. And I remember preaching through that, the book of Acts as a pastor, and I made that observation even then years ago when I was still an evangelical. I said, look, people, I mean, everyone says we got to get back to the early church. That's when they had it all together. I said, look at this. The narrative here in Acts, <laughs> within yeah. minutes of the church being founded, they're fighting over widows and food and set up and tear down. And I said, yeah. that's just like any church now, <laughs> you know, yeah. we yeah. still have the same problems in our church who's, today. Yeah. Who's a leader? Who isn't? Uh, yeah. Have you given 100% of your tithes and offerings? If not, we're going to strike you dead. Yeah. You, you got know? Ananias and Sapphira getting yeah. struck. Or you, um, and then you've got Paul's conflict with Mark. You've got Luke's and conflict. Peter church and you got peter's conflict with paul you've got you know mark's gospel which was considered an eastern gospel went to syria or came out of syria mm -hmm. you know you uh it's so much there. you read between the lines there was a lot of conflict and a lot of people have this idea like they do the bible that it's some kind of a monolithic thing that you can find its roots in where very very early on there was a lot of sects s-e-c-t-s that, yes. that rose out of Christianity and spread all over the place. It was very diverse, um, including, um, you know, people who chose to stay with John the Baptist as their Messiah rather than Jesus. And I think that's still a sect to this day. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's it's the the diverse. I don't know how in the world we got here, but incredible, <laughs> you know, the incredible yeah. diversity, and you know, to imagine that the early church was pristine and united and mm. blissful. And you know, yeah. um, just the ideal all, church, lovey dovey kumbaya is <laughs> yeah. totally, totally mis misleading. It's so true. I remember watching a documentary. I think it was on the BBC a few years ago, and it was about during the Victorian era. They had that was when the age of exploration really got off the ground, and there was a big push to go find these lost manuscripts of the Bible down in places like Egypt and these monasteries out in the middle of nowhere. And yet what they found, they did find monastery or monasteries with manuscripts in them that, that had never seen the light of day for hundreds, maybe a couple thousand years. And what they found was a bunch of Gnostic gospels, you yeah. know? So they were on this quest to like purify the Bible and make sure that all the old manuscripts, you know, matched everything up, nothing matched. I and mean, they were shocked to find that, as you say, there was all these little weird sects and groups and offshoots and everything that were off in the, you know, wilds of Egypt. And they, that yeah. really blew them apart because they were like, oh, my God, we got to account for all this stuff, you know? Yes, yeah, so the Gnostic uh, Gospels are probably the earliest of all the Gospels, actually. So, the you know, the, the whole idea of these Gnostic sects, um, Gnostic forms of Christianity were, were very early, but the majority won like the majority rule, uh, the power brokers won um, how Christianity was going to be uh, official and, um, you know, how it was going to go down in posterity. So, uh, mm. yeah, the, the origins of Christianity is very rich. The roots are, are spread out everywhere and, and the branches. So it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. And, yeah, the church history, and on one level, you could say, it, as you just said, it's been about the dominant power, like the church, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, trying to stamp out and suppress, quote, unquote, heresies. But the heresies were only what the church said they were. You know, one of my favorite periods I've talked about before was the Cathars in southern France. And in 1244, they went and wiped them all out because they said they were a heretical sect. You know, yeah. we don't know anything about the Cathars today because— the Catholic Church utterly destroyed all their writings, all their tech. We don't know anything. And they said yeah. they were heretical. And so they launched an army and destroyed the whole, all of men, women, children, all of them, tens of thousands of them. Yeah. You know, what's that about? That was our Catholic Church that did that. Yeah. 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 It's pretty, uh, pretty fascinating. The, it is. The, how the dominant, like you say, the power brokers were the ones who determined what we have today to read and um, consider uh, correct and orthodox. I mean, that's, that's the way it's always been from the mm. first councils, you know, uh, church councils to now uh, it's true. And, you know, we see it in the new Testament, like pretty, pretty early where you can see the the whole Gnostic uh, the, the opposition to the Gnostic ideas being expressed pretty early in the new Testament. So, yeah. 
It's true. Well, yeah, you go back, like you said, they go back to the creeds, Nicene Creed, Creed Council of Chalcedon, some of these other creeds that came out of the third and fourth century. It was an attempt to concretize, wasn't it? The this yeah. is what we believe. This, if you're inside this circle, you're orthodox. If you're outside, that we can excommunicate someone like Arius, you know, we can do that to these people because they're now heretics because they don't believe exactly what we believe. And they were arguing about words, you know, hypostasis and all this kind of stuff. It's got to yeah. be just the right word, you know, and if you don't believe it, you're a heretic. And so yeah. that's that's going right back, doesn't it, to the, the early origins, the first couple centuries of the church. They were already fighting about correct beliefs in air quotes. Well, I mean, the yeah, I mean, even in Acts, where, you know, yeah. you can see conflict between Paul and Peter and w- what was correct and what was not <laughs> correct. Right. So I mean, in air well, it, was, it was pretty immediate. And, you know, um, yeah. It's so true. And you read, you know, through the letters of Paul, I, mean, I know there's a whole debate on whether they're authentic, some are, are authentic or not. But the narrative there comes across that Everywhere he went, there was a group of people that were following him saying, you're not an authentic apostle. So he was always defending himself. And, you know, so he had that conflict to deal with. So, yeah, there were all kinds of sects and, you know, groups that were vying for power and control. And I guess Paul's gospel won out because, isn't it true, most of the church today is a New Testament church. And specifically, they focus on Paul's writings, I think, more than even the gospels. They don't really even teach or they don't follow the teachings of Jesus hardly at all it seems like it's more pauline theology yeah that's that's all really really fascinating to me like i uh, the i think pretty much agreed that paul's letters come down to romans galatians philippians mm. maybe, uh philemon and that's about it the rest are pauline yeah uh, written by his disciples or followers um and um like the pastoral epistles for example and uh where you know paul established a theology that was instituted into the church structure and um, and how you know uh you got you've got the theology and the praxis all in one package with paul's letters and pauline epistles and everything but and i I, like uh when i read um Jesus and the Disinherited by Thurman, um, the black theologian. And he tells this interesting story about his grandmother who couldn't read. And so she asked him to read her the Bible, anything but Paul. Mm. And he was too afraid to ask her uh, why until later in life, he learned the reason why she didn't want him to read Paul was she was a a slave uh, on, on a cotton plantation um, and in the southern USA, and um, the slave owners and masters loved Paul, and the preachers often would preach from Paul because Paul was all about slaves obey your masters mm-hmm. and, and and order and structure and uh, ser- serving and obedience and you know um, obey the powers yeah, and the structures. And and so they would favor those Pauline passages because it was about power. And, and Thurman's point was it's interesting because Jesus, in opposition to that, in contrast to that, rather, uh, was a person of an occupied nation. They were an occupied people, right, mm-hmm. uh, by Rome. They were occupied by Rome. So they were oppressed and occupied and and were therefore not the ones in power so for example a lot of teaches jesus teachings he said um are survival techniques for oppressed people so you know if a a soldier asks you to carry his uh pack you you carry it twice as far you know if if you get smacked on the cheek you turn your other cheek like just keep the peace right at all costs and 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 that was so eye-opening to me because hmm. uh, the church does favor Paul because it's in a position of power. And what do you call that? Uh, not favor um, privilege. Yeah. And Paul, Paul was a privileged person. Jesus was not a privileged person and, and Paul was a privileged person. And in fact, he took advantage of his privilege by requesting an audience with, with Caesar. Right. So that's just all very interesting to me how, uh, that one little insight where, of course, we don't favor Jesus because it's all about being an oppressed person. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas we favor Paul, the church does, uh, white, male, evangelical, mm-hmm. whatever. Roman citizen. Because, because it's all about power and privilege. He so, had all the privileges. Yeah. How many times did he get out of a whipping by saying, hey, you cannot whip me. I am a I'm Roman, Roman citizen. That's Whereas right. Jesus couldn't say that. No. If, we, if we accept the narrative as historical, for sure. But so is this how a person deconstructs? Because I know there's a lot of different ways that that lead to it. You could, like you say, you talked about on those twin train tracks, a person could have been abused horribly and by a mm-hmm. pastor or a leader or someone in the church or hurt really badly. That may have started them off. But in terms of, of theologically deconstructing, okay, I was just thinking when you were talking about some of the letters of Paul, we would not accept a scholarly on a scholarly level as having been written by him. Now, going back to when I was an evangelical, we would have been arguing right now that no, all of the letters in the New Testament that say they were written by Paul were in fact written by him. And, you know, that's your argument is completely spurious. But to entertain that thought, that's right. that's the, a crack in the concrete, isn't it, of the foundations to say, well, let's just say that maybe some of the letters of Paul weren't in fact written by him. What does that mean? Is it inspired? Is it, you know, it starts leading you on all kinds of rabbit trails, doesn't it? That's how my deconstruction started. Mm. Um, I was graduating from seminary, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary near Boston. Oh, yeah. I've been there. I was an intern there. Okay. And um, I was finished my studies. And for some reason, we were down in Harvard. And I was in the Harvard Coop. There was a bookstore there. And I saw a book on the shelf, The Silence of Jesus by James Breach. And I picked the book up. I was curious. I read the summary on the back and I thought, I'll buy it and see what happened. You know, so I bought the book and it shattered me. Mm. It, it uh, basically, um, uh, he argues that there's maybe seven sayings of Jesus that are authentic and maybe authentic. And then he goes and analyzes these seven sayings with a sort of a, um, a Nietzschean hermeneutic. Mm-hmm. And when I was finished the book, I still own the book. It's not very big. Right. I've never read and, it. And, and well, it's, it's not in, in my yeah, life. It's not well known, book, but it wasn't a number one bestseller or nothing like that. It was just a book on a shelf somewhere. And, and uh, he was a professor at York university in Toronto. And, uh, and, I, I keep bringing this book up because it shattered my belief in the inspiration mm-hmm. of scripture, the three eyes, inspiration, infallible, inerrant. It, I, and I was freaking out because I, up to this point was a complete devotee of the Bible, 100% yeah. unquestioned. And here I was, I was in my graduation gown and Lisa had to actually grab me and say, you've got to go to graduation. <laughs> you got to see this thing through. And you paid all this money. You did all the work. <laughs> yeah, I was freaking out. And uh, that began the slow glacial melt of my deconstruction, because for me, everything was founded upon the inspiration of scripture. If that went, everything that was founded upon it started to crumble. And, and so my, my um, deconstruction took 30 plus years or more, mm. you know, just that slow glacial melt. It was like a computer code on that day. A corrupt code was a virus got in there surged into my brain and it just started eating away. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any brain left? That's the question. Oh, yeah. No, and it took a left. long time, but uh, finally it, it came to fruition in 2009. And then the next year I left the ministry, but um, yeah, that's how it, it happened for me was the whole uh, questioning of the inspiration of scripture. That'll do it. Yeah. Cause like you said, the, the house of cards, the whole thing can collapse right. once you start to go, wait a minute. If that's, if I don't believe that anymore, what about this? What about that? What about this? Oh yeah. my God. And it, there's a million different avenues by which a person could start that. For me, it was reading progressive Christians. I think I've talked about this before, but Rob Bell, Brian McLaren, Donald Miller, and it wasn't, I see now I, I didn't just, you know, drop my faith overnight. I started reading those books and I, I was then questioning my fundamentalist dogma. So I thought I started thinking, well, I can jettison that, I can jettison that, I can jettison that, but I'm, I'm still a Christian. I've still got a bunch of stuff I'm going to hold on to that I think is really, really important. But I, the longer I jettison stuff, the, the less I had. And in the end, there was nothing left. <laughs> I, I had nothing left. And I thought, my God, there's, 
there's nothing left. But I mean, Donald Miller and those guys wouldn't have probably said, Hey, I'm, I'm writing this book so people can lose their faith and, you know, become agnostics or atheists or whatever. But that's what started me on that path. But it took years like you, it's not an overnight thing. Is it overnight right. with some people? Do you find that people just literally boom, drop their faith? And is it that yep. quick? So it yep. can happen. Yep. Um, I was just talking with somebody recently who was like, you know what? I'm done. And they just walked away from everything. Mm. I, my, there's different ways of, and there's no right way, no wrong way for me. Um, I needed to figure this out. I wasn't willing to Carl Bart is, is my favorite theologian to this day. Mm. Um, I'll admit that. Um, uh, but he said, and I read this many, many years ago, um, that the way you solve a problem, an issue in your life is you don't go around it and you don't reject it. You go through it. And so I decided very early on, okay, I don't believe in the inspiration of scripture, but some, for some reason, the scripture is still important to me. I'm, it got me to this far. I'm not willing to believe it 100% hook, line and sinker, but I'm uh, neither am I willing to reject it all and throw it all away. So I'm going to go through this and see what happens. And I, I worked my whole life in the ministry trying to reconcile these two things mm-hmm. where it wasn't inspired, but it was still had a role. And um, so it, it, it took me, it literally did take me my whole ministry. Mm-hmm. And finally in 2009, I had this epiphany moment where I saw that we're all sharing one reality is there's one reality. We all have our own way of apprehending it and articulating it, but there's still this one reality with many languages trying mm-hmm. to explain it. And that, and peace of mind came to me, the, my a- theological anguish immediately left peace of mind came. It's never left. And I, I started naively sharing this online and stuff. That's when I started to get in trouble with my my denomination and other churches and pastors were reporting on me and, and stuff like that. And the next year I was gone, but it was, yeah, they, they got me out. So that that's how it all started though, was um, me uh, not wanting to walk away because it was too important to me. Um, And on the other hand, I didn't want to believe it hook, line and sinker. And I I came to this place where it all kind of like a puzzle came together, a thousand pieces. It took 30 years, but the final piece was on that day in 2009. And the whole picture came out to me. Snapped into focus. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I did the right thing. That was the right way for me. You had a divine revelation. (laughs) <laughs> However, you had a Damascus Road experience. We've had too much. Of yeah, no, it was no, <laughs> it, it's so weird because there was no burning bush, no, you know, yeah. uh, voices from heaven, nothing like that. No blindness uh, for three was, days. It, uh, what I saw, Clint, it, I, I, I lie. Actually, I lied on my bed for an afternoon nap. I was mm. tired. I was exhausted. I was depressed. I was theologically in angst. And I closed my eyes and I saw this waterfall. And that was it. That's what I saw, a waterfall. And what I, and that's, I, I, I don't want to go into all explaining what yeah. it meant, but it was like, I opened my eyes and it was done. Like, that's it. Boom. Boom. It's amazing. When we come back from the break, we're going to get into the second half of this chat with David Hayward, my good friend from Canada, the naked pastor. What we're going to do is we're going to transition into talking about his cartoons. I have a lot of questions about that. I've been following him for a long time, and I love what he does with his artwork. And I thought, okay, I've got a a whole load of questions for David about some of the themes, some of the meaning that he infuses. And I really wanted to get into, do you believe that there is a historical Jesus? Because he draws a lot of stuff about the church and about Jesus. What is that all about? And so we have a fantastic discussion coming up in the second half in just a few minutes. I just want to talk about what's coming up here as we come up to the end of the year here. 2021 is already over. It's nearly there. We're almost at Christmas now. In fact, I think this episode with David Hayward is going to be the final episode of 2021. And then next year, though, I've got some really good guests, again, already lined up. I'm going to be talking to Elle Hardy. She's actually from Australia, from Sydney, like Josie McSkimming just a few weeks ago. But she lives down here in London, in the country that I live in, and here in the UK. 
And so she's written a book called Beyond Belief, and it's all about the global spread of Pentecostalism and how it's sort of, it's all pervasive in various countries all around the world. And she did a lot of research, field research, I should say. She traveled to South Korea. She traveled to South America. She traveled to South Africa. And she saw what it was like on the ground. And I'm, I'm about halfway through the book now. And I'm looking forward to interviewing her coming up. She's actually told me the other day we were supposed to chat tonight as I'm doing this recording. But apparently she caught COVID. So we've had to push it back a little bit. So I said, well, that's actually, I hate, I hate to say this, but... You having COVID gives me a chance to read more of the book before I talk to you. So no disrespect, but that gives me another few days. So we're going to chat later on in the week as I'm doing this recording. And then we had our last MindShift Zoom call of 2021. We were supposed to meet with Jonathan Larson, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. So we're actually going to reschedule that. We're going to do that a call again in January. This is another great benefit you get for being a Patreon supporter of the show. We're going to have Jonathan Larson of the Young Turks Network drop in sometime in January. And then I've been on a couple of podcasts as well. I just finished a recording with Celine and Steven. They're both from the UK here. They are the hosts of the podcast, What Should I Think About? We talked about Dominion Theology. And in fact, speaking of Dominion Theology, last night as I'm doing this recording, I was on another podcast, the Left at the Valley podcast. I've been on there before. We were talking about Dominion Theology as well. So A lot of people suddenly wanted to talk to me. I think they might have heard me on the Seth Andrews, the Thinking Atheist podcast a couple months ago, talking about Dominion Theology and all the research and writing that I've done on the subject. It's finally starting to pay off. So I've been fortunate enough to be on a couple of shows. And in fact, as it turns out, the more I talk to Stephen and Celine, it's actually his older daughter, they both come out of the Jehovah's Witness cult. And toward the end of the show, we started talking about the way the Jehovah's Witnesses believe in the sort of cult psychology there. So I said, well, look, why don't I return the favor? Let's book you into Mindship Podcast. We're going to talk about Jehovah's Witness beliefs, their experiences coming out of the cult. I think it's a different story for Celine because I think she was raised in it. But, you know, so this is a really interesting thing. So I'm going to have Stephen and Celine come on the Mindship Podcast sometime in January. So got some really cool stuff coming up in the new year. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with David Hayward, the Naked Pastor. Let's get back into it. We talk about this idea of deconstructing your former beliefs with the Naked Pastor. (laughs) Yeah, but now there is something, though, that's lingering in my mind. Okay, you and I both have a similar vibe in that we've already talked about we have this pastoral heart for whatever, for lack of a better word, we have maybe not the religious component like we used to when we were in churches, but we still very much want to care for people. We want to see them, you know, better their lives and whatever that means and how we, how can we help you? uh, When I first started my podcast, it was completely different name. I was trying to salvage the church kind of like maybe you were talking about, we have this passion for if people would just listen to me, the church could improve and go back to that great status that it once had, which is mythical anyway, but I didn't believe that at the time. But your uh, naked pastor work, the I don't know if you call them cartoons, comics, what you what you draw, you're still talking to the church because you, you everything you talk about is like Jesus protecting the LGBTQ community. Women are huge themes in your uh, cartoons. Sheep. You know, you, you have sheep, all and all these sheep doing stuff all the time, and it's somehow all related to the church. What's the connection? Why do you still care so much about those people sitting in those churches that are being hurt and abused by, let's say, pastors and leaders? Okay, so that that's a really good question. Um, and this, I know I use Jesus in my cartoons a lot, um, and God, the Holy Spirit, who's very cute. He looks, like, <laughs> he looks like a ghost. Um, Holy Ghost. Yeah. Um, I really care about people helping themselves become free, helping themselves liberate themselves. That's what I really care about. And so whether I believe in God or not, or believe in Jesus or not, whether he was a historical figure or not, whether I believe in spiritual or supernatural or any, that, I don't care. I really don't care. What I care about is what you, what the material you're working with right now, and I want to help you liberate yourself from whatever it is 
to get to a place where you're happy and comfortable, where you get to decide how to be spiritual. I always disclaim right here, when I say spiritual, I'm talking about our inner lives, our rich inner lives, mm-hmm. psychological, emotional, whatever. And I'm not necessarily invoking any divinity or supernatural or anything. I'm talking about our inner life. So you get to decide how to do that. I'm here to help you facilitate that for yourself. I'm, I'm only here to support you. Uh, I want you to figure out how to be free. And I'm here to support you in doing that. So I use, I use material Christians use in order to communicate to people uh, so that they can, they can deconstruct. So for example, when I deconstructed um, years, years ago, I had a picture of God, but at each time uh, when I was moving on to the next stage or whatever, that idea of God had to die. Mm. Right. And I got introduced to the next God at the next level. <laughs> <laughs> it was bigger, more gracious, less white, you know, less, <laughs> right. whatever. and then, and then when I continued growing, that God no longer sufficed, that God had to die. I got introduced to the next level of my spiritual growth and the next God. So it was like that. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking analogously. Sure. But that's, that's basically what happens is we, we have to let go of our former ideas and, and to the point where, we no longer need to form an idea of what God is or who God is or whatever there, the, because the word is not the thing. The idea is not the thing. What's beyond the words. What's beyond the idea. That's what I'm concerned about. And I want to help you discover that for yourself. So yeah, I use cartoons of Jesus. Does it, do I believe that there was a historical Jesus? Doesn't matter. Do I believe there is a savior Christ? Doesn't matter. Do I believe there's a God sitting on the throne in heaven? Doesn't matter. What matters is I want you to get free. And I'm drawing pictures that will help you do that. So mm-hmm. that that's I hope that helps. It does help because I, I love a lot of your cartoons because you have these recurring themes. Like I said, I see them all the time. For example, Jesus wearing a rainbow shirt, you know, right. or Jesus standing in front of a group of LGBTQ people, protecting them from the attacks of evangelicals. You know, that image comes across or yeah. women in particular, like I said, who have been hurt, who have or who are leaving the church. And the, the people are saying, you know, she's a terrible person. That's what we we all we all knew it was the truth. And she's walking away into freedom, you know, and, yeah. and you can see that that those themes just come across. Who's your yeah. audience? Are you trying to target Christians? Because this is another aspect you post on Facebook. I think you just posted this morning. I, I got up and I saw your your Facebook wall and you have these quotes you get from evangelicals, apparently. <laughs> and one guy said something about you're an imbecilic demonic you know person leading people to sin and so you get that a lot you get a lot of pushback yeah yeah, yeah i'm a demonic imbecile leading people into sin <laughs> yeah i love that you know and i yeah. love the fact that you share those and, and i see hundreds of comments sometimes they're like come on yeah. man really yeah my favorite one was that make a great band name <laughs> demonic imbeciles yeah yeah, yeah. that actually yeah. Could so, work. someone might use that so that yeah go ahead uh, <laughs> you're not gonna mind. copyright it it's, it's the good christian guy that shared it with me absolutely um, so uh i draw jesus in a way that i think good theology should portray jesus i may not like i said i may not believe the gospel's accounts of jesus the jesus they talk about i may not I may. It does not matter. I'm 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 drawing what I think good Christian theology should be saying. That's what I'm drawing. Mm. So whether I believe in Jesus or not is is immaterial. What's material is if you believe in Jesus, this is what Jesus would do. This is what a good Jesus would do. <laughs> right. What would and, Jesus do? Yeah. So I think good Christian theology and a, 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 a good, healthy understanding of Jesus would portray Jesus protecting LGBTQIA people, protecting women, empowering women, uh, you know, uh, criticizing the Bible, whatever. I, you know, the, I portray Jesus doing what I think a good Jesus would do. 
So that's what um, is behind a lot of my cartoons. So a lot of people mistakenly assume um, I believe in uh, the historical Jesus and that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world and that there's God and there's going to be a last day and Jesus coming back just because I draw pictures of them. No, that's not necessarily true. Um, I, 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 I'm not denying it and I'm not affirming it. What I am <laughs> thinking is that good theology would say this. And, and so I'm, that's what I stand behind. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, I happen to be speaking to a mass migration that's happening right now from the church and from Christianity. I'm mm -hmm. speaking to thousands, probably millions of people uh, who need help. They, they just want to know that they're, they're not going crazy, that they're not alone and that they're actually growing and um, that they're taking matters into their own hands as any adult should and uh, that's a good and healthy thing. So I'm here to tell them that. So that's why, you know, uh, I am speaking to a lot of Christians, but I'm also speaking to a lot of Jewish people who are, you know, I, a lot of Jewish people follow me. A lot of uh, Muslim people follow me. A lot of Buddhists follow me, etc. because it's all about spiritual independence. It's all about autonomy. It's all about personal agency. Mm -hmm. It's all about self-determination. And, and that's what I'm, all about but yeah i happen to appeal to a lot of christians because uh i like to stay in my lane you stand um, in your lane that's your wheelhouse stay in your lane. yeah i'm staying in my lane i'm not going to draw pictures of muhammad of course that's not my lane yeah I, and that would cause a firestorm if you and did. I don't want to against me and my family no um, but uh and i'm i'm not going to draw pictures uh related to judaism or buddhism or everything that's not my lane my lane is christianity ex-evangelicals I care about people leaving the church, people questioning their theology and beliefs. That's my lane. And that's where I, I thrive. And that's, I, mm. there's plenty of people there to help. Right. Clint. Oh there's yeah, plenty. absolutely. There's no end to them. Well, yeah. and you could see how, how your cartoon could work. I mean, I remember talking to a woman from Sydney, Australia a few years ago, and she said, one of the things as she was a, she was always a leader growing up in church. She was that her personality, very strong personality clearly right. identified as a leadership person, but yet because of the, like you said, the teachings of Paul and, and the conservative nature of the church, she was all, she always was hitting up against that glass ceiling. You know, so you take a person like her, who's clearly gifted in whatever sense you want to use that word to be a leader in the church, but she can't do it because of the structures and the strictures of the system. So she sees a cartoon that talks about Jesus empowering women. She could say, wait a minute, how come the Jesus I think I'm serving isn't doing that for me? How come this system isn't working? What the hell? That could start a person like that off on this journey, couldn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's one problem with the way I do cartoons is some people um, and, you know, I'm very sensitive to this. Some people find it triggering to see Jesus loving uh, an LGBTQ person because that hasn't been their experience. Yeah, it's been the opposite. The church has been the mediator between their Jesus and themselves, and they've never felt the love. So when they see a picture of Jesus showing love to an LGBTQ IA person or a sheep or whatever, uh, to them it's uh, doesn't compute because hmm. that hasn't been their church experience at all. So. I, I do get that. I don't know how to work around that. Um, but um, I'll tell you, though, 99% of the people I hear from are very affirmed and validated and are determined to see this through and make this work. They, they would like to see um, the way I depict Jesus become a reality in their churches. Hmm. Um, I would, too. Sure. I'm not against the church. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people think I'm an enemy of the church. I'm not. I'm an enemy of, enemy of uh, uh, bad churches, unhealthy churches, unhealthy leaders, abusive leaders. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I know I'd love to see the church succeed and, and to do community well and healthy. So that's why I keep doing what I do, um, hoping that. And, and I, I do see it sometimes where some catch on and uh, attempt to do that. But hmm. yeah, yeah, it's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing. And as we say that those themes come across the abuse of the LGBTQIA community, women, the, the sheep, you know, 
I love the sheep in your cartoons because there's they're always being beaten on and you know taken advantage of and abused. You think if I'm one of them sheep, how long am I going to sit there and take this crap? You know, and yeah. that's another thing, isn't it? I mean, how many times can you be shouted at by your your pastor for something out of the Bible when you just finally go like that person said, "I've had enough. I'm done." I'm not yeah. doing this anymore. I could be one of those sheep in your cartoons, you know, that's painting myself black with a spray can, you know, I think that was yeah. one that came out recently. Wasn't it? Here's how to turn yourself into a black sheep. Just get yeah. a rattle can and start spraying your, yeah. yourself black. Yeah. It's an yeah, there's thing. Uh, a lot of my cartoons depict what's actually happening. Um, so I show there's one LGBTQIA rainbow sheep or standing outside the church and they're all on each other's shoulders looking in the windows. And the first one says, oh, he's talking about love. And then the next one says, and he's saying, God loves us all. And then the next one says, oh, he just said, but. And, and the but. That's, that's the experience of a lot of my gay, transgender, bi, et cetera, friends. Yeah, it's true. I remember a couple of years ago, I was in Portland and I met up with a my old associate pastor when I was a pastor and we were talking about these churches that are quote unquote inclusive. And he said, no, in my experience, what that actually, they'll say we're inclusive, but what they mean is we won't discriminate against a gay person. They can come visit. They can come be a part. They can worship. They can attend the services. We won't tell them to leave. We won't tell them they have to get out. Uh, But what we are actually saying is what we're trying to do is get you saved. And then God will turn you straight. That's really how it goes down. So it's a sugarcoating this thing. We won't turn you away. We won't discriminate. So we're inclusive. And he says, no, that is not inclus- inclusion. That is absolutely not. That's a, a, a that's like a bait and switch in a way, isn't it? I yeah. think that that's reflected in what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I do. I've got several cartoons about that where rainbow sheep are wanting to play ball with the other sheep. And they're saying, well, you can come, but you just can't play. Exactly. And that's, that's what, uh, you, or you can watch, you just can't play. And, yeah. and that's, and I'm talking about being involved in the leadership and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Working All right. It. Well, you keep up the good work for sure. I mean, I know you, I love the stuff you do. We are Thank such you. good friends. We need to chat. We need to chat more often for sure. So for the two or three people that don't know where to find you, how can they get a hold of your work? Cause obviously you sell your artwork as well. You have a right. website. You also have, an online community. Can people join that if they want as a support sort of network? Yeah. So my, my main site is nakedpastor.com and that's where everything is. My blog, my cartoons, my merch, you know, I sell prints. I also do paintings and I've got mugs and hats and stickers and books and, you know, all the stuff, but yeah, I have an online community called the lasting supper. It's small. I like to keep it small um, because it's just more manageable. Um, we've talked about that before. Yes, we have. It can and, get out uh, of hand. So it's, it's uh, there's a small um, uh, payment gateway uh, monthly fee uh, for the lasting supper.com, but look for naked pastor on Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, Facebook, everywhere i'm 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 found as as a pinterest even naked pastor and i'm really good at responding to messages and and uh, emails so um reach out if you want to and as yeah. we say do not do a google image search for naked pastors i i, I still haven't oh. done that i probably should no no, no don't do it i mean <laughs> we might, i don't know what gets you off but uh naked pastor uh two words don't i wouldn't google it unless you want to see naked pastors <laughs> there uh, might actually be yeah. some naked pastors out there. If you Google naked pastor, you're looking for me. It's one word. Naked pastor is one word. And um, I should be the first one to come up. But I'm, as you can see, I'm fully clothed. You are fully and, clothed. Uh, I will I'm attest pretty, to that. Even though we'll, we're only doing an <laughs> audio version. But yeah, I will attest that David is fully clothed. He's got a, he's still got that majestic beard going on. So thank you so much, David. I've absolutely enjoyed again meeting up with you i'm sorry it's been way too long but we did meet up at court 2021 yeah. hopefully we'll be back around for court 2022 so we may be on another panel again i don't know we'll find awesome. out thank you so thanks, much man. take care enjoy your day and i will speak to you again thanks everybody bye